All right. Good evening, everybody. Tonight we are meeting with Mark Dean, and Mark's had a gallery for I think under ten years. Mark, how did you how did you get involved in this art world gallery life? We opened in September of two thousand seven, so it's been almost six years now. Can you hear me? Can you get a little closer and a little louder? Yeah, that is better. That's better. So you began in two thousand and seven. Yeah, September of 2007, we opened, uh, me and my partner opened a public space in Long Island City, which is in Queens in New York. Uh, we had a building directly behind the PS1 Museum. So um, I think about two years before that, I started working with a dealer named Garth Clark. Uh, Wait, now, were you working with Garth before this? Before we opened publicly, yeah, he had invited me to curate an exhibition in his project space in Long Island City um, that we uh, called One Part Clay. So it was 15 artists that I um, selected that were employing ceramics in, uh, ceramic uh, in a very contemporary way, or conceptual way, maybe not conceptual. Okay, so let's go backwards. How did, how, what's your experience in the art world? Did you grow up thinking you were going to be an artist? How did you get engaged? No, I'm definitely not an artist. I, I have no ability creatively. Um, I think for me, I went to school for business and um, I started working in corporate after I graduated with an MBA. And um, my partner being an artist helped me sort of become very involved in the art world in New York and to learn about the arts. And um, thanks to Garth Clark, he gave me the opportunity to have this exhibition. So that was really the beginning in 2000. So why did God, I'm sorry, but you know, God has a God has a large and solid reputation. Why did he trust you with curating an exhibit? I was kind of it was it was, it was good timing. I think um, he was planning on retiring in 2007, and he had come and seen uh, my apartment and a lot of the works that we collected, which were mostly ceramic based. And he was excited. He was excited about these new artists that he wasn't aware of that were working in the field in a very different way. And um, he gave me the opportunity to have this uh, exhibition in his project space in Long Island City, and that was a space that we took over one year later. So you were collecting? Yeah, we were buying work. We weren't really collecting. I don't know if there was really a focus other than works that we really loved and that were specifically um, made using ceramic in many, in many different ways, you know, 2D work, 3D work, of course, et cetera. So when you curated this exhibit, this was 2006, early 2007, what? In 2006, we um, were given a booth at the SOFA Art Fair, which is a show for sculpture, object, and functional art. And um, they That's had, in like early June, right? So this predates yeah. that? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So, um, and then the exhibition carried through SOFA. So it was like, I think we had a five-month run. It was very long. It's in Queens, and it was sort of, a place that took time to get to. So, um, yeah. That so, did you? Sorry. So, you didn't exhibit in Sofa per se. It was on exhibit while Sofa was happening. Is that right? We had both. We had an exhibit on view, a special installation that was the cover of the catalog and very long essay that was by our partner um, that was on view at the art fair. And we had the exhibition happening in the gallery. You're right. You're right. So, 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 Garth took you under his wing to an extent. Is that what you know? I know. I mean, again, he, I think he was excited about some people, um, you know, artists that he wasn't really familiar with, and he was excited about how the field was changing. And he was also, after 30 years, you know, sort of interested in learning, um, you know, what was happening now. And I think um, he was looking toward retirement and thought that I could possibly be a good person to start working with. So yeah, I was very lucky. But he, I never worked for him. I was never paid by him. Um, but he gave me the opportunity for the space. Okay, so then what happened after the Sofa show in early June 2007? So a year later, we, um, my partner and I, uh, bought a building that was literally across the street from where Garth was because the building that the gallery that he was in was sold. That building, so we had to find a space, and um, we looked all over the city. And we lucked out. We found a space, catty corner to PS1, which is the big museum out in, in Long Island City. And uh, we opened in September of 2007. Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. Now, how did you, how, what did you know about being an art dealer? Did you learn or did you just guts ball it like I did? 
when you began? Uh, how did, how did you, what happened? Well, um, you know, I, I started with hiring curators, curators that would come in and help me to develop the artists that we were working with. Um, my partner has also been very involved. Who he is an artist, and he in finding artists um, and dealing with um, artists and um, sort of coordinating between them and their studios and artworks that we would show. I really handle more of the business, especially now six years later. That's really what I've been focused on. My clients, um, uh, the gallery, the art fairs, you know, the face of the gallery, while he's behind the scenes sort of dealing with all the artists and finding all the artists um, and really helping me sort of build the program. So, yeah, it works. So did you learn how to curate or is it mostly not your job? Yeah, I mean, it's not. It's still not my job. It's something that I now am much more comfortable, and I have a lot more to say in terms of what artists I think um, make sense that serve the needs of my clients. So I think that's something that I've been very involved with. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I still defer to him, um, if anything, Ronaldo, and also um, curators that have been involved and advisors that have helped me sort of you know, build the program and bring in new artists. We've recently taken on three artists. Um, that have major galleries behind them. So that's a new interesting phase of the gallery that, that I'm going to explore. Cool. Hello, a couple of directions. Um, are you guys like equals in the gallery? Do we what? Sorry. Are you, e are you equals? Yeah, I think we are. And I think the artists, I mean, the artists are well aware of what's happening in terms of you know, his relationship with them and, and their relationship with me. Um, yeah, he's an integral part of it, and, and so am I. I think that was something that I knew coming in here, that I would treat this like a business and um, try to make it work financially. Um, I find that a lot of you know friends and uh, fellow dealers that have opened and maybe closed because you know they're very involved in the academia, they're very involved in sort of the institutional aspect of the work, um, and it's hard for them to um, manage the financial side, which is, you know, and, and really also learning to work with your clients and to sort of have that relationship. It's really outside sometimes um, the hands-on with the artists, if that makes sense. That's the truth for me. No, yeah, yeah, it makes sense, but all right, now, so that, let's say an artist work doesn't sell or doesn't sell well or you don't feel like you can do justice to the artist's vision. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out how the dialogue goes between, what's your partner's name? Can we name names here? Ronaldo. Yeah. All right. So between you and Ronaldo, um, what's the dialogue go? He, he brings an artist to your attention, and, and, and I mean, again, like it's really changed over the years. I've become much more comfortable in knowing what I think makes sense for me and what I can sell and make sense for the program. And also that it's an artist that I, I think I can help develop. Um, we it's a it's a small operation. We only really work with ten artists. Um, and um, I think that, um, yeah, he's he's been. I push what Tutuk said, not in. Hold on. Yeah. So, um, what you do an awful lot as a gallery, you do an awful lot for your artists. Um, well, I do what I can do. Again, it's a small operation, so we kind of, um, you know, take and our artists. And become black. And yeah. So how many art fairs a year have you been doing? I do probably 12 art fairs a year all over the world. Um, and I also work, um, another huge, huge part of my job has been working in the Middle East. So I work with a family in Kuwait, uh, Kuwait City, and also now in Doha and Qatar. So those are two different parts of the Middle East that I've been involved with. So I curate um, three exhibitions a year there, so I have two coming up now. Is that essentially outside work, or does that benefit the gallery, or both? No, I mean, it's, it's basically like I'm being invited. So it's the al Gallery, or, or the uh, Sultan Gallery, or the Doha Gallery, that invites team project, and I bring nine or ten mm -hmm. a group of my artists, and I you know, do <laughs> the, the, the press release around this idea. Artists outside the gallery also, that makes sense for that uh, place um, and those collectors and um, user awareness. And it's very specific there because you have to be um, aware of um, 
different types of uh, pressures like the, the work cannot involve sexuality or politics or uh, et cetera. So it's a little bit different than here, but yeah. Okay. Um, how how does the does the gallery run itself in your absence? I mean, if you're doing 12 art fairs a year, that's almost 12 weeks. You, you're gone 10 weeks. You're gone t at least 25% of the time at yeah, the gallery. I think I'm on the road 50% of the time. So, yeah, the gallery, um, we have an assistant who is there physically, and um, we're moving to Miami. So we're opening a space in Miami in September. So, um, yeah, I think we're changing. You know, we're three years in Long Island City, uh, three years in Chelsea now, and, and starting in September we'll be in Miami. So, so when you say Miami, you're leaving Chelsea, right? Yes, we're leaving New York for three years. Yeah. So are you anticipating that you're moving to Miami for a three-year stint, or? I think that's what my plan is, you know, to, um, to open a space there in September, um, September 5th. And uh, to focus on the market in Florida and South America. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Tell um, me how this decision came to pass. This is fascinating. Yeah, I think, um, you know, being in New York for six years has been great, but it's time for me to sort of um, start in a new place. I think to keep it interesting for myself and also my artists and to expose them in a new way. And Miami, Miami or Florida itself has become very important. Many, many of my collectors have um, second homes that are now living there full time. There's a huge you know, Latin, South American audience that's coming in, uh, Europeans um, all year, other than just Basel, the main art there. So it's a, it's a place that I think can really work. I'm excited about it. Where were you raised? Sorry? Where were you raised? Oh, in, in Bergen County, New Jersey. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> Do you see beyond three years in Miami? Do you, do you have a sense of what comes after that, or is it too early to tell? No, I think, I mean, the plan that I have set up for myself now is to be in Miami for three years and then work in the Middle East. So New York will go down to Miami, and then Miami will go to the Middle East. That's the plan. I'm going to work in conjunction with two galleries, in um, the one in Kuwait and one in, in Qatar um, while in Miami. So it's sort of... Yeah, I think after about three years, I'll move there. What are, you know, it, it, so mostly you run this gallery as a intelligent business proposition. The way I, I try to run my gallery? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I would hope so. I think so. But okay, I, so. I also so really enjoy what I do. So for me to move to Miami, I've been questioned by everyone, but I feel like, it was it's something I want to do. I want to try it. I don't I don't see there's no negative for me. I'm gonna be in New York every other week. My family my entire family is here in New Jersey and New York. And all my, my client base, my, all my interior designers, everyone I really work, all the art fairs, I mean it's here. So I'll be back and forth. I think I can juggle it. I think it's gonna be fun. And keep it interesting. I mean, I can't afford a big ground floor space in Chelsea, so why not sort of do something bigger and go to Miami? Sort of, I don't know. Are you going to make a big statement in Miami, or are you going to make a small statement? No, I don't need to make a big statement. I don't really think. I think the gallery is um, the, the idea, the model of the galleries has changed. Um, Jerry Saul just wrote a great review for Gawker about um, the idea of galleries changing. Um, Roberta Smith, a few months ago, for the New York Times, wrote another fantastic review about um, the importance of fairs, the importance of travel. Um, and how the galleries are, their exhibitions are running longer. They're having less uh, uh, exhibitions here. Less people are going to the exhibition. So for me, as a, a, being in a gallery building, it's frustrating. So I feel like if I can't spend 30000 on rent for ground floor, why not at least go someplace that I want to be and try something new and keep it exciting? Let's go back to work downtown. If I, you know, if it was for money, if it was just for the income or for the, you know, the salary, I wouldn't be doing this. You know, I do it because I love it. I want to keep it moving, keep changing. And I feel like it's a good gateway to the Middle East. So. Oh, I feel like what you're doing is really fresh, and it's a lot of the reason I respect your program is, you know, the yeah. freshness and the authenticity, and you know, that, that, that it does feel like it flows from your vision. And I think that the artist. 
you know, we should show some of these artists, shouldn't we? Um, you know, and that the artists that you work with are, I don't know, this, can you describe your aesthetic? Can you, um, yeah, well, it's changed. I mean, again, when I started with Carl Clark, it was mostly ceramic based, but we really moved away from that. So it's, it's artists that are, um, you know, dealing with issues in contemporary society. It's all conceptual work, but at the same time, um, it's work that has pop aesthetic. So that sort of sums it up. And if you go to, is this me? I can use this. No. No, I got it. Yeah, you go to artists, you'll see that's actually on the home screen is a big, Sculpture by Tim Burke, who went to Alfred, and he's one of my original guys from the Strap world. Um, but I think Tim Burke and Rebecca Myers and Brian Drury are good examples of artists that I really have been able to grow right out of school. And that's dealt with me for seven years. So um, as you scroll down, you can see a lot of great installations from their work, um, the humor, but also the technical side of all their work, um, which is very, very important. Like that twin pop piece, I think, you know, shows that idea of things disappearing in the environment, but also, you know, in terms of how they build the work, the technical aspects are very, very important to finishing. So, great installation there. How do you artists feel about you moving? They're excited. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a small group of artists, and the majority of them are emerging or have been emerging. Um, and they've kind of grown with me. Uh, the artists that I represent, which is, again, just a handful, you know, I found them when they were MFAs, when they were in school. So you know, I've been able to grow with them, literally. When was the last time you took on an artist? I took on three artists uh, since December. Um, Hans Blonham, who's well-known, uh, who's with Marlboro Gallery and working with him directly now, a painter of 30 years in New York. Uh, Michael Dweck, a photographer, who works with Stanley Wise Gallery in New York. And um, Brett Murray, a sculptor who works with Whitman Gallery. So these are three artists that I started working with directly, um, with uh, through my relationships with their galleries. So these are relationships that wouldn't happen if you were remaining in New York City. No, no, these relationships have been happening before our uh, our Basel Miami. So these have been in the works for six months. Yeah, but if you were staying in New York City, would you be have these relationships, or would they not be because they already have New York dealers? There's no difference. You know, I think a lot of these big dealers are excited about their artists being shown um, in a different way, in different art fairs, in different contexts, um, to a different base. So, yeah, they're excited about it. I, mean, I was, especially at the Marlboro Gallery, where I was kind of intimidated at first, um, but their feeling was, look, if you can help our artists get placed, we believe you, we like your vision, we like you, and we like what you've been doing in your gallery. So, yeah, go for it. Good for you. We don't want a percentage, just sell our artists' work and we're happy. And the artists are happy. <laughs> so they're not taking a percentage from you? No, and that was really important for me too, to sort of work direct with these artists in a way that's fair. Just like I would want any gallery to come to me. An artist, if a gallery was interested in my artists, I would expect the same them to come directly to me, which they have, and say, we want to use him for a group show, I want to like to show him, I'd like to learn more about him. Um, so that's how I handle it handled it for all, these, all three of those artists who are new for the So, how many artists do you show in an art fair? Ten. You show all ten? I feel like it's usually, but three of them have much more of a spotlight. Yeah, people kind of know a few of my artists more, I think, in terms of the place and the booth and um, the price point and what I've been able to sell. So, yeah, I think that's uh, makes sense. You know, their past sales and their base for people that are interested in their work, and also these artists developing new works for me. So that, yeah, there, there are a few artists that get a little more attention, for sure. <laughs> why? How? Why? Well, attention from me, because <laughs> they keep developing new work, they're pushing themselves, and they're making artwork that is viable for me. You know, there's artists in the gallery that you sell well, and there's artists you believe in that are difficult to sell. So I think um, a, a big responsibility of the artist to keep up, to keep themselves you know, immersed in the field and to learn and to see and to go to auctions and figure out what's being sold, prices. You know, I know you don't like the word trends, but it's sort of like be aware. Well, 
Okay. Um, do you think artists are too prone to romanticism? No, I meant like in terms of the idea of working as a working artist. Yeah, right, I know. They have to be realistic. So, no, I don't think they're prone to that, but at the same time, they should be aware that, you know, what they're getting into is very competitive. There's a lot of, there's 2,500 public galleries in Manhattan. It's insane. It's crazy. So, it's really difficult. I mean, imagine how many exhibitions are happening every month. Imagine how many dealers like me are kind of, you know, struggling in the sense of where their gallery. I'm on the second floor of a gallery building of 50 galleries, so it's really frustrating. You know, I'd rather be in a big full ground floor present, but it's just not viable. Um, so I think for artists too, imagine how many are being, how, how many are creating exhibitions, and these exhibitions where they aren't getting a lot of attention. I think a lot of the attention today for artists is from the fairs, really. Thank God for the art fairs. And again, going back to Garth Clark, they didn't exist when he was in business. Uh, when he's private, he's working secondary now, but when he was you know, operating a gallery, there was the ADAA fair and SOFA. And SOFA was very specific for Sharon. But those are the, that's all they did, and they did them because they had to. They did it because their clients wanted to see them there, but it wasn't to sell. It was about sort of a social event. Um, so I think the idea of the gallery has changed. I'd like to hear what you think about that too. I mean. I'm, I'm curious. Some, somebody commented that I'm too loud and you're too soft, and I don't know if I can talk softer and you should be louder too. Oh, um, I hope you can hear me this whole time. Yeah, I can hear you, um, and I hope it's okay. Um, I don't know. I'm concerned because I think that the genuine artistic viewing experience happens <clears throat> when you and the artwork are in the same physical space, and if you know, if you create art, artwork for an art ex, art fair, you know, you're not creating necessarily in the same suite or dialogue of work that you would be making for an art gallery exhibit. And I think there's a different kind of accountability that comes from that. I'm concerned that there's fewer viewers that go to art galleries and fewer, you know, art, less art. There's less dialogue happening, or the dialogue that's happening is more staccato as opposed to has more depth and meaning to it. Yeah, I mean, that's true. The context in the gallery is very different than an art fair. I mean, you can actually think, and like you said, there's a group the exhibition that's happening. There's an idea in the gallery that's very different. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's something that will, that will always, it, 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 it's impossible to take that away. I guess I'm just trying to think of new ways to expose them and also feel like what I'm doing makes sense. You know, I question, for example, I have exhibitions in the gallery where my clients will come to the gallery, see the show, meet the artist, go to the dinner, it's a party, it's great, it's fun. They'll buy the artwork at the fair that follows. They won't buy it. I mean, they, they literally, they, they love the idea of buying at the fair. They like the spectacle. They like the idea of being able to bring their friends back and show them what they thought. They like that conversation. Um, and there's an urgency in an art fair. In an art fair, a client has 15 minutes. They can put a piece on hold for one hour. You know, it's done that day. Where, and it's one touch. They come and it's one touch, that's it. When you come into a gallery context, it's five touches. There's five pieces, I, there's five times I need to touch that client before they'll consider buying the work. So it's fresh, it's a long process and the fairs are very fast. There's a, you know, there's just an impulse. How much more do you sell at fairs than in the gallery? Um, you know, in the beginning, the art fairs were my, were the, being in Long Island City, especially, you imagine, it was difficult um, to draw the right crowd. I mean, I was also learning and growing, so it was invaluable, and I loved it there. In fact, I think when I think back to that experience, I miss it. I feel like coming to Chelsea to a second floor space has been I, I miss the uniqueness of being in Long Island City, where people say, oh, I remember you from Long Island City, or your space in Long Island City, it's something that they remember. We're now just in the mix. So another reason I really want to try Miami is to kind of keep it, keep people talking, and keep it interesting for me. Um, but the percentage, I would say, honestly, well, I would say that in terms of clients that buy from me, the relationship was found 
um, in the art fairs. I would say 90%. And now sales since are different that happen in the gallery, but if I go back with that client to where I met them originally, it was through an art fair. For sure. So to a large extent, you're selling your personality. No, I sell good work. Well, that too, but you're also charming. I guess it's part of it. I mean, I enjoy it. Again, I like people. I was in PR for many years, and I really love the work that I'm showing, and I think that's something that collectors see immediately. You have to relate to the work. Um, you have to really believe that it's good work, um, and I think that translates, really. I, and I've been very lucky. I have a lot of great um, advisors and um, good collectors that have really supported me. So, yeah, it's a field that you can really excel in if you believe it. Too many dealers that are trying to sell work they don't believe in the things they can sell. So for me, I've never taken that. I've never taken that easy road, I guess, because what's again, what's the point? Why? I can't do it in a big way for those artists. So why not do what I can do the right way? So. What are the thing, What are the services? What are the things you can do? I mean, it, it goes beyond sales. I mean, are you trying to get your artist gallery exhibitions with other galleries in other cities? Um. If they can produce enough work, there's an artist um, that's a good example named Brian Drury, who's on my website, and he's a painter, and he paints these unbelievable paintings of uh, corporate and great natural world paintings. And, you know, he's an artist that I will have two exhibitions for next year in Europe. That's his first time being shown there. But it's difficult. They don't, even Tim Burke produces those twin pop pieces you showed before. They don't really produce enough work to have multiple galleries. I right? sell everything they make. So that's, you know, this is Brian. Those are all paintings, if everyone can see those. Um, so they're incredibly detailed paintings. Um, they look like photographs. And um, he's a great example of someone that I um, had a lot of success with. I, he, he was, I got him a review in the New York Times uh, by Ken Johnson. Uh, he was accepted into the, the, the uh, American Academy for Invitational, which is unheard of for a 28 year old. Um, and I have a wait list of 15 people that have paid deposits for his next payment. So it's something that I really have developed with him in terms of making his work, which again, when you ask about like what attracts me to certain artists and what kind of works do I show, he's a little different than the majority of my artists, but it makes sense in my context in, 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 in the, the, the artists that I show. I think there's a real abstraction to his painting. Although, like, in this picture, it's super tight, photorealistic. But he's really capturing the essence of these people and also the looseness in terms of the background, the jacket, the ties, the collars, um, the jewelry. So there's a real play, which is just phenomenal. So how do you, how do you, how do you, are you discriminating him about who buys the work? Um, for his paintings? Yeah. Yeah, well, for his paint, well, for all my artists, I think, I don't think discriminating, no, but I, I'm very selective. I, when I met Brian, he was at the New York Academy, and he was in his last year for MFA, and he had five paintings, and they were for his thesis, and uh, or for his graduation show, and he was working on one more, and I said, look, let me have these five paintings, I can sell them, I'll put them in good collections and uh, we'll work together and he was really excited and that was the beginning of a great relationship and now three years later he's had two reviews in the times and he is going to have two shows in europe next year but back to your original question yeah it's hard because he doesn't produce enough painting so the dealers i'm working with one in portugal and one in brussels from um, belgium he'll they'll um both receive one painting eventually that they'll be able to sell direct to their clients. So 50, 50, I won't take a percentage. So that's the deal. They allow me to show this new spiritual series, these leaders of spirituality, and um, have that travel to two galleries, first in Miami for me, and then to Lisbon, and then up to Brussels. And then those two dealers will be able to have a painting each in the future for their clients. And that's enough that to keep sense. them happy. That makes sense, but it seems like they're doing all they're they're making a large commitment without much of a return for them. Well, I think the return is the relationship. You know, I think for them, it's the idea of being able to show an artist um, that is developing in a new way. Um, his paintings are, 
and again, like when you scroll down, you see them. They're just the detail. It's just it's, it's unbelievable to think that one person is painting this work. And there's no gimmick. Ken Johnson said they should do. There's no good gimmick. It's just good painting. So I think these dealers want in, and the best way for them to do that is the relationship they have with me, and sort of figure out. Um, okay, yeah, let's do a show. Okay, it'll be sold out, but at least we'll have a show for this artist, and I have access. That's the way in. How much are these paintings sell? What do they sell for? They sell for like a nine inch by eleven inch painting starts at about thirty thousand, and then they go up to, I guess, you know, majority of around you know fifty to seventy five thousand range. How did what what were the prices when you started with this artist when he was brand new? When we started with him, the same size painting was eleven thousand, I guess. So in the three years, I guess three no four years, um, yeah, they've gone up in terms of what makes sense to what he's producing and the demand too. I mean, the fair prices, the paintings we sold in the beginning weren't underpriced. It made sense. They were his MFA paintings. You know, it made sense to have that product and see as he's grown since. What are the criteria you use to determine when it's time to raise the prices? Hmm. Um, I think it's a conversation I, uh, I, know, I think, I know it's a conversation I have with the artist, um, you know, in terms of what they're planning for the year, um, you know, what they're doing, how much work they're developing, um, and what makes sense for their lifestyle. And also, for me, I mean, of course, I'm the, I, I had that gauge. I know what, what works are selling for. I'm very involved, you know, in being in the public galleries and being, and even at the fairs, gauging prices. So, like I said before, for artists, it was a good place to go and learn. Um, so, yeah, I think his paintings are still underpriced. I think a thirty-five thousand dollar portrait um, is fair. It's oil and wood. It's just it, the process is just unbelievable. He only paints ten paintings a year, also, so ten or eleven paintings. So. We have to be fair too in terms of him making a living. Oh, true. Um, are you are, you, are you representing the number of artists you want to be handling? Is, that, how, is it ten or is it thirteen? Wait, what? Sorry. Am how I many how many artists are you handling? Well, I think ten, but I think it's much more. I mean, I'm always bringing in artists, you know, from outside the gallery per se. You know, in terms of like in Kuwait, for example, I have to bring artists that are maybe outside of. Um, my list or, or my roster because um, it's so specific. Are you looking for more work? Do you want people to, from this course to send you stuff? You froze. What an opportune moment. Um, um, I, I, can't, can't, wait, hold on a second. Yes, okay, good. You froze there for a moment. Hey, you know, you made a comment that somebody just reminded me of. You made a comment that you had good advisors and good collectors. And yeah. when you said you had good advisors, what did you mean? Oh, sorry, art advisors. I, that, yeah, I'm more like a consultant, good art consultants, people that buy work for corporate collections, people that buy work for collectors. Okay. So, so, yeah, not advisor. I meant more as an art advisor for yeah. Um. Critical in this field. Critical, critical, critical. Do you feel like the model, the way you run your gallery, is different than how most galleries are run? Yeah, I do. I do too. Um, do you feel like, um, are you getting advice about that? Or is this pretty much you on your own? Um, yeah, I mean, dealers and artists and are always giving me advice, and I'm always trying to think what makes sense for me. Um, but I and I also have had a lot of offers for backers. That's another touchy thing that I don't. I'm not involved with in any capacity. I'm um, also on back the gallery because you get into a place where um, it's uncomfortable and it's not yours. And I feel like as long as I have this and I'm growing as I feel like I want to grow, um, I'll control it in that sense a little bit more. Yeah. So. As long as it feels right for me and it's working and I'm, in, and I'm happy, then, and I'm making good choices for my artists and they're happy, then I think it's working. Let's open this up for some questions. I saw one hand, but I'm assuming there'll be more. I've got more questions if we want. Nancy, go ahead. Other people with questions, raise your hands, okay? Go ahead, Nancy. 
Um, I was wondering if you could say um, more particularly how this gallery is different from other galleries. Um, it's been alluded to several times, but it's not real clear to me. Want me to answer that? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, I don't know how I'm different than other galleries. I think most galleries are very similar to me in terms of working with relatively young artists, you know, in their early, late 20s, 30s, um, doing lobby art fairs, um, getting out there the best you can. Um, these galleries, like I said before, there's 2,500 galleries in New York. I mean, there's gallery buildings full of galleries. My gallery's a thousand square feet, it's a small space. Um, so I, I don't know. I think, again, my artists are different than most other galleries. I think everyone feels that way. But yeah. Paul, what do you think? I'm not sure. Um, I think your vision is crisper, is clearer, is more defined than most galleries. Um, your aesthetic. And from talking to you, it sounds like there's a greater emphasis on doing business. But I'm not so sure. I think maybe you're just speaking to that more, and I'm not sure that it's really, that it happens more. Um, Doing business meaning like operating. I don't think mean doing business in terms of sales or focus on sales. No, I thought it meant I meant more on sales. And I was wondering and I was speculating that it would be there would be less about getting gallery artist exposure with other galleries and that you know that but that still is a large part of your emphasis. So I'm not so sure how different you are from another gallery that's been around for a similar period of time. Yeah, I think it's a huge pool. I think thank God for the, again for these art fairs. And a lot of these new B&Ls and try and there, there, there's so many things that are happening where um, you can, the architecture is taken away. It's just your artist speaking. Good work is what's being sold. So at the art fair, the booth that I have or the stand that I have is equal to some of these major galleries, which is huge, huge gallery spaces. So that's all removed. All they see is good, it's the artwork. And that's the unbelievable part about it. That's why the level of playing field is there in a way. So, yeah, that's become very important. Um, how old are you? 38. 38? Yeah, almost 40. Is it sad? Come on, give it a break. Um, um, are most of your artists within five years of your age? Um, probably younger, I would think. Probably most of them are like in their early 30s, late 20s, I think. How about your, what age are your collectors? Uh, I, well, thank God I have a, a bit, a, a large, um, well, there's, I mean, most of them are older, for sure. A good collector who's able to buy work and think about work in, in, in that way, I think, is older. Um, but I also work with, like, the Sephardic community here in New York. is a very important part of my gallery business. Um, and it's a young demographic. They're young. They're in the 30s, maybe early 40s. It's a generation from the families that moved here and sort of started these businesses as developers and in the fashion um, fabric trade. So yeah, that's become a very young audience for me and now they're children. Um, but then also, you know, my core collectors which who are probably older. I mean, I don't know what older means, but like in their 50s, 60s, that kind of thing. Who else has questions? I can't believe that. You guys have to have more questions. Do most of, what's the price range of the art you sell? Um, I would say 5000 to 40000 range. Affordable. Most of the work's under 50000 and that's something also that I think is very important, too. I try to keep the work below fifty because I feel like when you get to 50000 it shouldn't just be something that you really want to have. I mean, I think it's something you should really have an advisor help you figure that out as a good investment. But under 50, I think it's just, I always say just, I mean, something that if you want to have it, then go for it. It's going to enrich your life. Agreed. Now, the, some of these articles we've been alluding to talk about how the top end is doing really well. The middle tier galleries, which I think is you, um, are getting stretched out of the existence, and the lower tier galleries aren't doing very well either. Um, you don't seem to have a particular problem. I don't have a problem. I wish my artists made more work, really. And I wish I could handle more artists, but I physically can't. I, I like, I need to control them. Like I have, like I like to be able to sell all of their work, or the majority of their work. So, okay. I'm doing fine. I'm doing John, fine. go ahead. Just wondering, it's, 
my instincts tell me that over the last, well, 10, 20 years, the art market seems to be growing. There seems to be more and more people coming into the market. Yeah. It, the, one of the things I wonder about, though, is are lower income people coming more and more into the market? I'm wondering what your thoughts are about those two issues. Um, yeah, I think people are more aware of, you know, thanks to the internet, I think, and access, and also the fairs, um, going back to the fairs, um, and also the museums sort of how they've grown their programs and uh, the excitement, you know, from the communities at large. I think, yeah, there's, uh, people are buying work at much younger ages, i found since I started. And again, Garth Park is sort of, you know, my gauge for things, and I know that for him, they didn't really have a younger audience. Um, it was very specific to ceramics, so it was a different type of collector, I think. But yeah, I sell to um, to all age groups. You know, I have works available that are quite affordable. You can buy a print per se or an edition piece that's a thousand dollars. So yeah, I think the market's gotten much, obviously, much bigger. There's so many galleries now. There's so many artists who are working full time. It's great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So. And there's a lot of money outside the U.S. I think that's another thing, too. Me being in the Middle East and working um, in two countries right now um, says a lot about, you know, sort of the um, demand for American art. The majority of my artists are American, or who's live here. And they're interested in that. They like that idea of sort of this Western fantasy. So, yeah, I think also it's also grown in terms of geography, where um, you know, you can, your clients are around the world. Where where do you see it going? How big is it going to get? What do you mean? Well, I mean, it it just seems to me every year art becomes more and more important in the world culture scene. More and more people are coming to more and more fairs. Where is it going to be in another twenty years? Is it going to be everybody has art art in their houses? Is it going to be why not? Food, you know, <laughs> good. Yeah. Those days are coming. Yeah, thank God. You know, when I grew up, was growing up, my parents, they were involved in the arts, and they had great work, but it wasn't something that they changed. It was something that was very slow. It was a slow process. Yeah. But now it's exciting. I mean, people are buying, they're curating their own collections. And again, you can be on a budget. You know, Jen Beckman has this great, you know, 20 bucks you want to do, whatever it's called. And you can buy prints for 50 bucks. From Lawrence Weiner. You can buy prints from every artist working out there. William Redman, I mean, it's fantastic. So access is, is, is critical. And it's amazing to think that you can live with this work. It challenges you. It makes you think. Yeah. So why not? The bigger, the better. I don't see a problem. Right. As long as you can trust the dealer and you can trust the artist, um, I don't think it's a problem. But trust is a very important part of this business. It is indeed. Jen, go ahead. I was just wondering what you've noticed about selling work by women in the Middle East. If things are different there because of culture. Yeah, you know, I went there thinking that um, it could be an issue, but it's amazing. I mean, they're just interested in, in, in and again, like, I mean, they're aware. They travel um, around the world. They're very sophisticated, especially in Kuwait. Um, in Qatar, I'm just learning about Qatar. I mean, again, they're buying a lot. There's a lot of information in the news about Qatar and family um, being involved in the arts. But in Kuwait, where I've been for years now, um, yeah, women are very powerful in these places also. So it's not, it, it isn't different to them if it's female artists or male artists. Again, it's work that speaks to them and their interests, period. Um, it's irrelevant. But what's amazing for me, which was a big misconception I had before going to Kuwait, was that women were to be taking a back seat. But women are the ones who are literally driving or literally coming into the gallery and buying this work. So it's really incredible. I think, you know, the empowerment of women there is something that's, um, misconceived here in the U.S. So, yeah, does that answer the question? Thank you. That's exciting. Yes, cool. Okay. Um, 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 hold on. Then, um, Jenny, go ahead. Hi, hey, Mar. Uh, thank, thanks very much for talking with us. Um, it, it seems to me that you are especially gifted at establishing international relationships. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that works. Oh, geez. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, again, I think you know, the market's become so big that your colleagues and your friends in business are around the world. So for Portugal and for Brussels, uh, Belgium, sorry, those two countries in particular, I have a close relationship with two dealers that have galleries in both cities or each in a city. And it's something that was a conversation that happens, you know, somewhere in the world, we're sitting at a table and it's like, let's have a show. Let's, I like this artist, let's do something. So yeah, I think it's pretty critical in terms of the dealers being out there. Another side of a gallery, the physical gallery that I find frustrating, I can't be there very often. So, um, you know, I'm one person and I, and I don't have a staff. I don't have, you know, someone that does what I can do for me. So I know all the numbers, I know everything that I have in inventory, I know what my artists are doing. So it's kind of a, maybe a growing pain. I'm not sure if it's a growing pain. It works, but um, yeah, and, and in, in the Middle East, for example, that was a relationship that I had with a collector who bought work for me in 2007. And um, he was uh, Al Sabah, which is the royal family from Kuwait. And he was like, you know what, I really like what you're doing. Would, if you had a gallery um, in Kuwait City, what would you do? If I gave you a spacer, would you come up with a cool idea and come meet me? This is in Miami, it's an amazing story, and it's true. Uh, he said, come meet me at the Tiano tomorrow. I'll give you 24 hours to come up with a great concept for an exhibition. <laughs> and meet me at the Delano uh, in Miami during Basel, and, and you know we can talk. So, you know, out of a movie, but that's what happened. And that's how I was introduced into Kuwait City. Yeah. Those random things that happen in life. Well, how long ago was that? A year and a half or a year or a half? Two thousand seven. That was a long time ago. Okay. So it's been a working relationship for four years. That's wild. Um. All right, uh, Michael, go ahead. Uh, hey, Mark. Thanks for talking with us. Um, to pick up on the uh, international theme some more, uh, you, you mentioned the um, Sephardic community in, in New York, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, what your plans for going to South America are, gonna, are what you're looking to do there. And also, have you, um, you also talked about the Middle East, have you done anything in Israel, or do you know anything about like the Tel Aviv art scene? Oh, geez, there's a lot of questions. Um, well, the Sephardi community for me, I know a lot of them come from Colombia at some point, and um, Carousel and a few other, but they're mostly, you know, their families have come from Spain, I guess, two generations ago, now they're all here. So that okay. community is sort of fell into in New York. It's a very big community. Um, and um, it was just, it's just a, another group that I've been involved with. So right. like, back to the question of like, who's buying art now? Their parents weren't buying art. Their parents don't understand what art is. For them, it's decoration only. So the kids who are now just getting into their forties get it. You know, they have the income and they want to be involved. So it's become right. a new market for a lot of cult dealers. Um, South America, I think, is um, very important. People think about Brazil, but there's also Venezuela. I mean, Chavez is politically a disaster right now, but we'll see what happens on the 14th. But uh, Venezuela is a very important market for me. Colombia, Mexico. Um, Argentina is tricky because it's mostly like a European sort of approach. Their, their whole relationship to being Latin is different. But yeah, so I think that's a very important place. And yeah, I think in Miami, specifically where they're buying, they all have homes in Miami. And a lot of their countries are sort of like in turmoil. So a lot of the work that I was selling in South America was basically coming back to Miami. So yeah, I'm interested in exploring them more. That makes sense. Yeah. And you say that Argentina is not. You were saying that Argentina has more of a link to European. Yeah, I guess so. so That's interesting. I mean, you know, for Argentinians, they're fine. No, so I think um, that's not a joke, but yeah, I tried an art fair in Argentina, it didn't work well. They're very slow at, at buying, but um, yeah. So I'll focus on mostly Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico. Okay. And, so, and, and the what, question? Was there something any, uh, what, what about Israel? Have you been to Tel Aviv at all? To... No, I had an opportunity to work with um, the Lit Back Gallery, which specifically focuses on glass. I met him a few years ago, Amuli Lit Back. So he has a, a huge gallery, a gallery tower that's in Tel Aviv. Uh -huh. And 
I never, I haven't done it yet. I would like to. I mean, there's so many great Israeli artists working, um, but I find it's very specific to their place to their country, the work that's being made. Right. And it, I haven't really related to it. And not as being a non-Jew, I just haven't been able to relate to that idea and that past. It's too right. specific for me, too close. And I mean, again, there's so many artists that are working out of Israel directly um, that are outside of that, but that's just sort of what I've been seeing. And that, that's the fiber I feel like in that work. Right. Well, so, thanks very much. Cool. All right. Lindy, go ahead. Yes. Um, hi, Mark. Thanks a lot for your talk today. Um, I was curious with all the different countries that you're targeting, um, South America and uh, the Middle East, are you finding that there's a particular uh, taste or aesthetic that the countries are looking at by country, or is it pretty broad? I think in the Middle East, it's very young in terms of um, you know, their awareness of art, um, to think about it conceptually. Um, so I think there is more of an education, like bringing artwork that I can sort of talk about and explain and sort of have them realize why this might be important. Also, like how this will affect their life and why it's important to live with good art. Um, I think in South America, I mean, it's, it, their, their histories are so long, I mean, it's impossible. So, but in South America, there's, their tastes, I find, um, are more limited than I have in the Middle East. So, I think they have a different understanding all the longer um, it's been maybe more difficult. So yeah, I find the Middle East a little bit more exciting. The like piece of product Jews are working with, which are a great audience. I mean, they're just, they're open to it. They want to learn, they're excited about like good work. So in a different way. Thank you. They're not buying artwork that they think looks like what art should look like, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I find in South America they're trying to buy art that they think looks like what art is supposed to look like. Right, I get it. So yeah, which I find fascinating, but it's true. I mean, it makes sense. So. Cool. All right, Atanas, go ahead. Uh, I am abstract artist, and I do very colorful abstract art like in your back there. And my question is about uh, where is the best place to show my art in the United States? <laughs> the best place to show your work? I mean, I think my advice for artists to get on my radar, maybe, um, or any gallery, is to really take the time to go on their website and to look and see what they're showing. If you're in the city, go to the gallery. You know, take the time to really figure out what that dealer's approach is and what they're interested in, and then send them an email. Don't, I, I get packages all the time and I feel horrible. I mean, again, I'm a very small, small operation, so it's hard. But I think the best way to get involved with the dealer is just to send an email. Say, hey, you know what, I've really been interested in the artists you work with. I love Timber and Michael Dweck's work. It relates to mine this way. Take a look at the attached images. You know, I, I find nothing more offensive than a blind copy, or sometimes not even a blind copy, from an artist that has 100 dealers info at every gallery they know of, saying, um, I'm really interested in your gallery, I've attached images, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you're not, because you're sending it to everyone you know. So, it's like, if you're gonna do that, I just feel like it should be specific. Galleries only work with 20 artists, let's say. So, I don't think emailing 100 dealers um, is really wise in any, in any way. So, just, you know, just like your work, it should make sense in the context of that dealers or other artists. This should be a family. It should be able to communicate together. So. Agreed. Yeah, it's simple, right? I feel like it's obvious, but I'm always amazed, 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 amazed at that whole idea of artists just sending like mass emails. Where I don't know, does it work? I don't, I don't think it does, but uh, it seems like some kind of instinct. And I think sending my entire mailing list, my entire collector base, say for example, my my real VIP list. Uh, you know, a new artwork is being produced by an artist. Like, I have this great painting, you know, whatever, 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 you know, please find me attached. It's like, well, they're like, why are you sending this to me? It has nothing to do with what I collect. It's nothing that I'm interested in. Why? So I feel like this is the same. It's just so clear. 
So that's, I think, very important. And what you're saying is, is that when you send when you send email to your collectors, you're sending personalized emails more than a general generic email to everybody. Yeah, of course. I mean, I again, it's a handful of artists I work with. They're producing a handful of works. It's an operation that's me, really. It's my partner and I, but basically it's me. So it's something that we handle, we manage. And I physically know every single piece that's been sold by the gallery is been sold by me. So, yeah, I know who's looking for what. My artists aren't producing prints. They're not producing things in mass. So, it's, it's, you know, it's a really edited and slow process in terms of, you know, what clients are waiting for what work. Um, and that's what's so exciting about it. After all these years, I'm able to, like Tim Berg with the Twin Pops, when he creates a new wall sculpture, I can send it to 20 people. And those are the people that are going to buy it. So, it's a, you know, you're dealing with very small audiences. I think also. Okay, cool. Anybody else want to say anything? Michael, your hand's still up. Wait a minute, MacArthur. You'd want to say something, MacArthur? Wait a minute, I muted you. Go ahead, MacArthur. No? MacArthur, I'm going to mute you again. Anybody else? John, your hand's still up. I said you asked the question. Do you have another one, John? I have one more, if that's okay. Ahead. Sure. I've always kind of been curious, um, in terms of gross sales, uh, how much does an art gallery in New York City have to turn to survive? And then um, if you want to be a super duper gallery like Pace or something, what kind of dollars are those people turning a year? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's impossible, again, like, it's impossible. I, 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 I'm not sure, you know, look, I buy, it's hard to with my net and my gross every year because I buy so much work for my clients from other dealers, big names, I'll buy, you know, a Kenny Sharp painting, for example, a James Nair's painting we just bought, um, uh, Mitch Kapoor, who, I buy a lot of work that has nothing to do with my gallery, uh, Matisse Aquachent, who just bought it was Phenomenal, and beautiful, beautiful, but expensive things, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, and I take percentage and all that. So, what is my, you know, ROI for the year? I mean, it's impossible. I, I just need to, you know, I know my numbers. I know what I'm doing. I know what's in my accounts. So, um, yeah, we've been growing every year in terms of sales and in terms of profit. Also, it's a very expensive business. Even having a small gallery is expensive. It's really yeah. expensive. going to an art fair. For me to go to Miami for Art Basel, which I don't do, I do one of the satellite fairs, it's, a 30, it's at least $30,000, minimum, minimum, 30 grand. You're writing, you're writing out probably $40,000 in checks before you just step foot in the booth. But that doesn't include me being there, my, my, my people being there, shipping, dinners you have to have, which is another, for me, I'm always amazed by the fact that I have dinners for my clients and I'm always the one paying. I, I still don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm the poorest person at the table. I don't want to take this check. Right. So, yeah, it's a very expensive venture, but um, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm Mark always amazed huh? at, at how much money is getting spent to keep this all afloat, and how galleries make those that nut. You know, that's a big nut. It's it's a, it's, a, it's 24 seven. You, yeah. I don't have. I mean, I have days off. I can't complain because it's. You know, we have two months off in the summer, and it's amazing. I mean, it's a cool schedule. But you're on all the time, and your clients become your friends. So your whole life becomes part of this world. Um, so it becomes sort of muddy. So I think Miami, for me, is also a personal choice where I want to sort of like a step out of a place I've been, and I have a lot of people that are sort of dependent on me in a way, and they feel like um, they have access to me. This, you know, a lot of these interior designers I work with, you know, in particular, and you know, other members of this community that feel like clothes available. So I think being removed will help me in my business too. Great. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. I think we're good. Go ahead, Sal. MacArthur, go ahead. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Type it to me quick, okay? You type it, and I'm going to go see what Sal has to say. 
to type me your question, MacArthur. Sal, go ahead. I was wondering, um, Mark, I appreciate everything you have to say quite a bit, and I was wondering if you have any suggestions other than, um, you know, Hold email on. gallerists, how, how artists that are working in places that are outside of mainstream areas like New York or, or you know, big cities can network and connect um, to dealers like you? I think it's important for also then to have someone, you know, approach the gallery that's outside of that artist. I mean, that's another way that I, you know, a lot of these curators help me find artists that I can work with. And again, like if you go on my website, it's very specific, it's a small group. But in terms of the projects I'm involved with, um, I need a lot, I, I need to have access to a lot of different types of work. So I think that's another angle that could be helpful to sort of have someone that work, you know, that you're involved with in academia or in a museum setting or someone that's involved in the arts as a professional that can recommend you. Other dealers recommend artists to me all the time, and that's also very important. Then I, then I, then I think, I look, I take the time. I always take the time, but I mean in terms of it being more specific. So I think that's not a good angle. Think about who can champion your work who's in the field. So that they can, and then so you find the gallery you want. You want to be with XYZ Gallery. Find someone that, you know, that can help you that's outside of your, you know, yourself as an artist. Um, get in there and recommend your work to them. That's, I think that's a really, that, that's, just, that's pretty critical today. All right. That's a um, I mean, you're very involved. You go to all the fairs. That's what we met. So, what do you think? Um, For artists. I mean, no one's sending slides anymore. No one's sending CDs or mail. I mean, it's like, what do you, how do you, it's just a conversation that happens, I guess, right? Oh, yeah, I think it's an outgrowth of relationships, and I think you need to grow relationships, and you need to see people at fairs, and then ideally you visit them in galleries. Or you seek to, you know, enable a, an email dialogue, or you try and befriend or be friends with someone who's showing um, at a gallery that you respect, where you think that, you know, you hope that your work is going to resonate. Um, and or you find out if they're doing something out of the blue. But I think, you know, you mentioned that you're not so hot about receiving unsolicited packages. I kind of, um, you know, oh, no, I, I, I like that approach. Yeah. That, but look, if you have a beautiful catalog or something that's printed, great. Um, I guess it's more of a CD thing for me. Like, it's, it's old school. Like, you're getting a CD in the mail um, with, like, a, a bio. It's like, I need something visual. So, yeah, if you have a nice piece of, you know, marketing propaganda, then maybe put that in the mail if you're being very specific. But I find it sad in a way that I'm thinking if I'm getting this much, then I can't imagine what the big dealers are getting. So just that the artist took the time and paid to have their beautiful catalog mailed to me, and it has nothing to do with what I do. So that's that, that's what I mean. No, that's a mistake. Sure. That, that's and also like I'm just yeah. I meant also in terms of getting a DVD or a CD in the mail. I think that's sort of. Alarming. No, I like to send something. I believe people want something physical that they can look at. Um, MacArthur asked a question, and then we're going to see if we can help there. Uh, Mark's idea for a global gallery is brilliant. As for the South Americans buying art that they think is what art should look like, are they buying for themselves or investments or to impress their friends? I think it's more family. I mean, yeah, I think um, a lot of these um, collectors I'm dealing with or clients, I guess, they're not really even collectors yet, at these art fairs, yeah, they're just, you know, th for them it's what they grew up thinking, you know, like that painting of a horse. I mean, it's like that's what they think or like the idea of Picasso. So I think that's something that the relationship you have with that person helps them sort of develop and educate them and think in a new way. So I kind of take that as a challenge. I think it's cool, you know, that at least they're interested, at least they're willing to buy. Um, but yeah, I think in South America, it, think about South American lifestyle also. Look at I me, mean, look at what's happening there. I mean, again, Venezuela is my example. I find it just infuriating. I find it all sad to think what Chavez has done to that country um, and those people. So they're stuck in a different time. It's a different, like, almost a generation. I mean, it's really unbelievable. So I think their art buying and their awareness. I mean, look, Sophia Embar, which had the contemporary museum in MoMA of Venezuela, Caracas, was, she was fired when Chavez came into power. He closed her museum. <laughs> like, that was the one way for people in Caracas to see new work being made. That's very, I mean, top, I mean, so I think that's another 
problem there is, is, is access. Good point. All right, let's wrap this up. Dude, thank you very, very much for all the information. You know, I think it helps demystify how the art world functions. And I hope so, like in a small, as a small gallery, it's, I, this is just me being honest. It's not really, I'm not thinking too much about what I'm saying. I'm just saying what I feel, so. That's good. Let me unmute everybody so they can echo my appreciation. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you.